Hello everyone and welcome. This is Joe Minardi coming to you live from the WVU Emergency Medicine Recording Studios. And today what I want to do is I want to go through some material that can help us with some of the sickest patients that are going to be in front of us. And I promise you that if you take some of these skills and work on them and then apply them to the appropriate patients, you're going to dramatically make a difference in some of these patients' lives and you're going to save some lives with some of these skills. So we're going to jump into point of care ultrasound of the heart and lungs. But to start this off, we're going to talk about point of care ultrasound of the heart. Now, there are a lot of scenarios where I think the heart and the lungs go together, and we'll do both of them. We'll talk about them in separate, but we'll try to bring it together into the scenarios where you may need both in your patients who are acutely short of breath. Here are our objectives for our CME purposes. Take a look at those. Essentially, we're going to decide which patients can benefit from point of care ultrasound of the heart and lungs. We're going to talk about how to get the images, how to recognize the findings, and how to incorporate that into clinical care. To introduce these things, we're going to talk about a few cases, and then we'll try to bring these cases back into relevance. So this is our first case. A 59-year-old man shows up with a syncopal episode, reports that had some heartburn prior, but really has no symptoms right now. Vital signs are pretty unremarkable, maybe a little bit bradycardic. Our next case is a 49-year-old female who comes in with chest pressure, has noticed in the past couple days shortness of breath on exertion. However, sitting here at the bed in front of you really doesn't have any symptoms. Vital signs don't look too bad. And we can see a portion of the echocardiogram here. We'll talk about that more. In our third case here, the 43-year-old male who's got some cough, increased shortness of breath. I really had these symptoms ongoing for a while. They're getting worse. Multiple visits, been on meds for reflux and allergies, and just doesn't seem like it the patient's getting any better. Vital signs don't look too terrible, but the patient does look short of breath when you talk to him. And our last case is a 19-year-old female with shortness of breath for a few days. I had been seen, just finished a Z-pack for these symptoms. You know, there are your vital signs. They don't look too terrible either. And there are some of your findings. We'll talk about those as well. So what I'm going to tell you and some of these things we're going to go through, I promise you, like I said before, you practice these skills, you know how to apply them appropriately to your patient at the bedside. You're going to use ultrasound to help you tip the scales of life and death in favor of life with ultrasound. So I hope you like my little uh, graphic to represent that thought. So we're starting off with echocardiography and what I want you to recognize is really we're going to keep this pretty simple. We're really only going to try to answer five questions with our patients at the bedside. And for most of our patients, it's really only four questions because the first question is, is the heart beating or not? And usually the patients hopefully are awake and interacting with us. So that lets us know their heart's probably beating. So here are the five questions. In code situation, is the heart beating? Uh, then the rest of the questions, which will apply broadly to all these patients is, is there a pericardial Fusion, and we'll talk about signs of tamponade. Is there left ventricular dysfunction? And usually we're talking gross pump failure. Is the right ventricle dilated? We'll talk about what that looks like. And then any just obvious valvular or aortic pathology, primarily signs of aortic dissection, which is something that we can miss easily if we don't think about it and look for it. The reasons to apply a basic echocardiogram are anybody in shock that's hypotensive or the far end of shock, which is cardiac arrest, but then any of the symptoms that we commonly see, like they're having chest pain, they're short of breath, they've had syncopal episode, they're having palpitations. I'll even throw in sometimes it's reasonable to take a look if they've got some kind of non-specific EKG abnormality and you want further information, or they've got elevated troponins without a good explanation and you want further explanation. And the way I like to summarize it is if you actually feel like it's important to know what their heart sounds like, then it's also important to recognize what their heart looks like, how it's functioning, what the chambers look like. So if you feel strongly about listening to their heart, you should probably take a look at their heart as well. And then also, anybody who warrants an EKG, I would argue warrants a bedside echocardiogram as well. You're going to get complementary and additional information that you just cannot get with your history, physical, EKG, chest x-ray. And I guarantee you will find diagnoses that you would not have otherwise found, and you will save lives and prevent morbidity and mortality in some of your patients. Okay, some things that we're not going to do, at least not with our introductory things with point of care ultrasound. We're not going to rule out ischemia. Or we're not going to rule out pulmonary embolism. We're not going to rule out vegetations like an endocarditis. We're not going to rule out aortic dissection. We're not going to quantify the severity of any valvular pathology. We're not going to cover diastolic dysfunction pretty much at all. We're not going to get into complex congenital things or estimate filling pressures. So if that's what you're looking for, look for that in a future discussion. 
So just a reminder, the five questions, is the heart beating? Is there pericardial effusion? Is there left ventricular failure? Is the right ventricle dilated? Is there obvious valvular or aortic root pathology? So we're going to talk a little bit about just wiring images and what the orientation is. Again, for some of us that maybe this isn't that natural, we're just getting started, we haven't done it that much. So let's take a look at some basics about anatomy and how to acquire basic images. So first off, you have to recognize that the heart lies in the chest. It doesn't really lie vertically. It doesn't really lie horizontally. It's got its own axis within the chest. So this is kind of its long axis. Short axis goes this way. And then it's got its own coronal axis or four chamber axis, which is another way that we'll slice it to get some of our echocardiographic images. So those are the basic three planes from which we'll slice the heart in the images that we're going to get. This is the probe we want to use. This is the ideal probe for getting cardiac images. If you don't have this probe, you can sometimes use the curve and get in between the ribs and get subcostal views. Don't assume you can't get any images if you don't have the phased array transducer. This is the ideal transducer to get echo images. And importantly, we want to make sure we're in cardiac settings or echo settings. I'm going to point out a couple things about that. One, so there you see that's sort of a cardiac setting. The indicator is going to be on to the right of the screen, which is kind of different than every other application we've been doing. We've been looking at, if you've looked at anything in the abdominal or for procedures or anything else, the indicator is pretty much always on the left of the screen. And this is just kind of the agreed upon convention. There are a few folks who switch it around, but I think if you're ever communicating with anyone else in the cardiology world or the critical care world, it's just best that we all do it the same so we're all kind of talking the same language. So indicator should be on the right hand side of the screen in a cardiac setting. And that's the assumption we're going to make as we move through. Most of the time, our patients are going to be in a supine position. If possible, sometimes we'll have them roll up onto their left side with that left arm up under their head. Obviously, in some patients who are more ill, this isn't going to be possible, but whenever it's possible, if you can, this may help you get better images. It also helps to kind of work them through different parts of their respiratory cycle. Exhale, inhale, sometimes there's a half inhale that's going to get you the best images. So just a few things to mention about your hand skills and using the probe. You want to have your hand low on the probe. Again, hold it like it's a pencil. The base of your hand needs to be stabilized against your patient's body or you're going to struggle. When we're first looking for our images, we'll fix the position of the indicator. So say we're going to start with the indicator at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Don't rotate. Don't move that indicator to a different clock position. You do your movements by sliding or fanning or rocking to find the image you want. You only change the indicator position once you've identified a good image and you want to change the orientation of that image. You want to go through every different view. You want to have a kind of a mental checklist and the more you look at normals this is going to become more intuitive really go through the checklist of normal findings and what those normal relationships look like so that when you see abnormal things they hopefully stand out and just pop into your brain quickly 